So my name is Roy Hall, former Ohio State uh, wide receiver, also played in the NFL for four years, uh, played with the Indianapolis Colts, was drafted in the fifth round, won a national title in 02 with uh, Coach Jim Trussell uh, my freshman year there, and then went on to lose in a national title game when Coach Urban Meyer was coaching for Florida and he was still on the dark side. And so um, we had some bad memories in my last game as a Buckeye. Uh, but I had the opportunity to experience some amazing things and learn some, some things and pick up on some tips that uh, will allow you to be successful in life long term. And so I am here today to pass those things on because after my dream of being a National Football uh, League player ended in 2011, I had to figure out what I wanted to do next. I had to figure out how to really walk in purpose and use and leverage the platform that I had been blessed with, even with the NFL, but after the NFL, to be able to make a difference long term, to leave my mark, to make an impact. And so uh, we, and by we, uh, my partner Antonio Smith, who is also a former Buckeye and our vice president for the Driven Foundation, we established a charitable nonprofit organization called Driven. And we've been plugging away for the last eight years, uh, just in the trenches with a lot of families and communities all around the state of Ohio. Since 2008, which was the inception of Driven, which was our rookie year, uh, we've been able to distribute almost a million pounds of free food to over 7,500 Central Ohio families. Every single year, we feed 1,000 a, a families a week's worth of food around the Christmas uh, and holiday time. Uh, we're actually in the middle of building a barber shop on the inside of an inner city elementary school so the kids can get haircuts for free every single week. We have 15 mentorship programs from ages, uh, grades, fourth grade, all the way through seniors in high school, all the way from Cleveland, all the way down to Portsmouth, Ohio. And we do 10 to 12 week programs. We have other former Buckeyes that lead us through and through. You can check out the rest of the things that we do on staydriven.org, by the way. I don't have that much time. But we do some amazing things. And what I found out when I made it to the most elite level that you could possibly make it to in the NFL, there's some certain, th certain things that you have to do to be elite and to stay elite. And so today, I want to teach you a little bit about building leaders uh, within your business, developing leaders within your business to really perpetuate and to push growth and your culture, et cetera, et cetera. But before I do that, I want to... Um, expose you guys to Antonio Smith's book, Waiting to Fail. Now, another former Buckeye played in the NFL with me as well, but he wrote this book some 10 years ago, and I don't think he knew what he was doing when he wrote it because he wrote it uh, to kind of tell his own personal story and where he came from and why he got started, but he didn't realize that he was giving us really the tips and how business should and shouldn't be run. Right. From a culture standpoint, from a leadership standpoint. And so I get an opportunity to talk about this. So I want to read this. Uh, you guys know it was story time. I bet you didn't know that. Um, it's only two pages. Right. Two pages. Can you guys deal with me on two pages? All right. So here we go. We were playing my favorite childhood game called King of the Hill. Anybody play King of the Hill growing up? Most of the boys did or some of the girls, too. Absolutely. That's awesome. Some of the, and so it says, despite the name of the game, we never played on an actual hill. We used any makeshift platform or surface which boasted even the slightest elevation. One particularly hot summer day, my neighbor's porch happened to be the hill. For those not familiar with this game, it is played with much physicality, mainly consisting of pushing and shoving. To become the king, you must endure and withstand all forces to be the lone person standing on top of the hill. One of the best characteristics about King of the Hill is the king usually doesn't stay king for long. Someone eventually musters enough strength to get off the ground, charge back to the hill, and dethrone who is, who is king and crown themselves. Those who possess enough will and determination usually become king at one time or another. I shoved, they pushed. I pushed, they shoved, just as three young, rough, energetic boys should. I had been crowned king five times. Even as a youngster, the feeling of being king, being successful and superior, couldn't be matched. As the air grew warmer, we took a break. Taiwan, Ori, and I flopped down on the porch. As our panting calmed, we talked. The conversation started out as it always did between Taiwan and me, both of us proclaiming and defending ourselves as being the better athlete. Ori was the tallest of the three, but he never entered the best athlete dispute. His talents did not include athleticism. Anybody here just non-athletic and you know it? Yeah? You probably, one person raised their hand, nobody else is going to. All right. 
appreciate your honesty. After a few minutes of self-glory, the conversation turned to me in Taiwan, uh, saying we were going to play professional basketball and be on the same NBA team. I'm going to play for the Bulls, I shouted as I threw up my hands uh, as if I were shooting a basket. It was the era of the great Michael Jordan in the 90s who led the Chicago Bulls to five championships. Me too, yelled Taiwan. Just as the conversation reached the point where we were verbally dreaming of winning an NBA championship, Ori's dad came out of his house and sat on the porch. The presence of Ori's dad made us lower our voices as if we were in trouble. Ori's dad was mean. He was erratic. You never knew what you were going to get from him. One day he was seemed kind and warm. The next you would think he was Satan in the flesh. That was funny. I thought, I thought it was anyway. <laughs> you boys having fun, Ori's dad asked. Yes, sir, we replied. Y'all come over here. I want to talk to you. As we gathered around, Ori's dad said, tell me what you want to be when y'all grow up. He looked to his son first and waited for his response. Um, I want to be a doctor, Ori stated uh, after hesitating. That's good, son. Without hesitation, Taiwan piped up a childish smirk on his face. I'm going to be an NBA player, the best ever. Since I didn't want to be like Taiwan, because you can't be a copycat as a kid, and say NBA player, I said with confidence, I'm going to be a lawyer. There was a pause of uncomfortable silence. Ori's dad looked me square in my eye and replied, boy, you ain't going to be nothing. I was nine years old, told by an adult that I would become a failure, that I was a failure, that my dream would never be achieved. Words like that aren't something that you ever forget. Spoken at such an impressionable age, such words have the power to permanently damage a young mind or become a self-fulfilling prophecy. I bolted off the porch with tears in my eyes after running a few yards got choked up and couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. I was going to push back against any forces that tried to take me down. An unexplainable emotion ran through my heart that day. I knew I was going to be the exact opposite of what Ori's dad told me. I was going to be something. And to me, that is the most powerful part of the entire book, the first three pages, because it sets the tone on why all of us are here, because the story of being in a situation where you feel like you're down or you're starting from scratch or you're trying to figure things out and not having the support that you think you need when you're getting started with a nonprofit or a small business or whatever it may be, you feel like you're by yourself sometimes and the people that you thought would have your back long term, turns out that they don't. But in this first three pages, he introduced us to what we call the hill, what we call the hill. And in this particular excerpt, it was about the king of the hill. And what I loved about it is the whole goal of the game is to get to the top of the hill and fight off as many people as you can, even though you started the game together. We're all friends. We're playing this game. But the whole goal is to get on top of this hill and you got to keep everybody away from you so that you can hog up all the space so that you can be successful. You can be king. You can be supreme being for as long as possible. And it's interesting how leadership and in business, it happens the same way. That's not the hill I was thinking of. It is a hill, though. It's funny to me that actually this is how most of us live our lives. Monday, you got to rev it up a little bit. Tuesday, I'm pushing. Wednesday, here it is. Thursday, you already looking for Friday. Already looking for Friday. Friday is downhill. Saturday, oh, it's Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday comes back around. This is the hill of life so to speak, but this is how you're not supposed to live. You can't have three what feels like three or four days of grinding it out, and then for the other three and a half days, it's smooth sailing. This cannot be your constant cycle of life. It just can't. It just can't be. But from a business standpoint, as you guys start taking notes, I want you to kind of draw this on your own where you are. Or at least take a mental note or pull out your phones and zoom it up and then you can get this screen. But business, culture, growth, et cetera, revenue, everything, that's, that's the pie of your business. There's a starting point on this hill to climb this hill and there's a finish point on the hill, a business, period. This is 
how it's always structured. You come into a business, however you got there, you're starting in a new position, you're hiring people, people start at the bottom, they're learning as much as they possibly can to climb this hill to eventually reach maximum potential. Because just like the game King of the Hill, you have to reach the top. Everybody's trying to get a certain goal, a certain platform, they're trying to reach something. You don't just go to work to do it. There has to be a common mission, a common vision. And so obviously people start, everybody's moving up. When you get to this point, maximum potential is here, mostly because you can fit the most people at that particular part of your business, right? And then downhill and you finish. That's the cycle of business. The only thing missing from that picture that I showed you were those dots to my left. Anybody want to know what those dots are? Take a guess. Because this was before, something was missing. Here's our chart. What do the dots represent now? The people. So we got our structure, we got our business, we know what we want to do. We're trying to figure out how to develop leaders and what's the purpose in developing people? What's the purpose in doing that? Like, I'm trying to build my business. I'm trying to build my organization. I want to get more uh, notoriety. I'm trying to do the right thing. We got to get more money. We got to do like, but we can't do any of those things without the people. And so, like I mentioned, the people come in usually at the same place, right at the bottom of the business. And ideally, you want most people to be at maximum potential. Maximum potential, you wish everybody in your business, everybody within your structure organization, you hope that they get and reach maximum potential. That's what we want. We want you to reach maximum potential, whatever that means. Listen to a seminar, go to a podcast, listen to a podcast. We, we need to get the, these people, as many people at the top and to be the king of the hill in their respective areas of our business. Now, the interesting part about the hill is it doesn't really go that way. Raise your hand if you think everybody rises at the same time in, every, in business and probably not. Probably not. Raise your hand if you think this is a little bit more in the model. Like different people, different, nobody raised their hand. Shaking your head, come on. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, most people, you have people that are just starting into the business. They learn more about the business. They're around the business for three to six months. They're learning the culture. They're learning their understanding. They're growing. They see our goals. They're trying to work hard. They're showing up every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. They're kind of going up the hill, and so they're doing that, so forth and so on. you got the one person who's always maximum potential. It's usually probably one of you all in this room, right? At the top of the company, understand what's going on, always trying to get information out, but you're, uh, you're at the top, you're reaching your maximum potential, and then you have the people on the way out, right? The people that have kind of gone through the system, they kind of aged out, so to speak, and they're towards their way, their, their way out. It's kind of spread out. And I was always wondering, because there's really, when you're thinking about life and thinking about business, most people don't go through the cycle of, I came into a business, they trained me up, they developed me, I reached my maximum potential, I stayed there long enough to see the company grow, and then I'm going to leave and transition gracefully out and be an ambassador and be the best company, this is the best company ever. It usually doesn't happen that way. There's usually not a person finishing at the finish line. The finish point generally is right where you started. If you remember that first slide that I brought up, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, that person on that bike was going uphill. And generally in business and in organizations that don't develop their leaders from within, the place where you started is the place where you finish because you don't even make it to maximum potential. You don't make it to the other side of the hill. You're always the person on the bottom trying to fight and scratch. And when you get tired, when you get tired of trying to get and reach your maximum potential without development, without good culture, without leadership, you'll tumble right back down to where you started. And generally, that's what happens. Our starting point ends up being our finishing point. We don't get an opportunity to see the other side of the hill, and we don't get an opportunity to reach maximum potential because inside, the person at maximum potential is, is really focused on keeping the business going, keeping the revenue growing, keeping our growth growing, and that they don't pay attention to the people that are just falling back down. Because you figure the best of the best will always rise to the top and those are the people that I wanna work with anyway versus thinking that everyone that I'm introduced to, everyone that comes into my business has an opportunity to reach 
maximum potential. This is why they have an NFL draft every single year. It's actually going to be uh, next Thursday, Friday, and Saturday where you draft 265 plus people with potential. Some people have a little bit more potential than others because of what their resume says, but that doesn't always pan out either. Some of the best players in NFL history have come in the second, third, and fourth round, fifth round, sixth round, undrafted guys, people that didn't even get a starting point or a starting opportunity. But because they had leaders at the top reaching maximum potential, developing their leadership skills from within, developing those people, their team was able to grow. I'll give you an example. Russell Wilson, when he came into the NFL, his first year, he made $350,000 on his rookie year contract. His second year, he made $425,000. That second year is when they won the Super Bowl, right? He just got paid $160 million yesterday. But when he started, he came in learning the culture of the Seattle Seahawks. The money was being given to the defensive guys. But he just came in and did his thing. They developed him as a leader, as a quarterback, didn't have to pay him that much money, but he had the potential. And when you reach maximum potential, we'll give you what you're worth. But our job is to develop you as a third round draft pick from a quarterback situation. OK, now some of you all are like I don't like football, so give me a different example. I don't have one. <laughs> this is what this is really supposed to look like. This is what this is really supposed to look like. There's a start and a finish. That's always going to be the same. But you want people to transition to ambassadors, agents, people that can speak highly about you, your company, your business, and your respective trades. Can anybody from where you are and see, I know we, the dots are a little bit smaller, but what's the difference between, say, this chart and this one? Anybody want to take a stab at it? You can talk to me. It's fine. I speak English. It's good. Anybody? Who said that? People are together. Simple. It's simple. It's simple. All of a sudden, instead of everyone doing their own thing and there being one person at the king of the hill as the king of the hill, now all of a sudden, every area and every layer, there's a duo. There's a duo. See, greatness demands a duo. Success demands a duo. You cannot do anything on your own. There's no such thing as being self-made. You always need to have someone with you. And so when you're first starting business and you start with just your idea, you have to have somebody right next to you so that you guys can reach maximum potential together. Because whenever you feel like you want to quit, whenever you feel like you want to tap out, whenever you feel like you want to throw in the towel, whenever you feel like you don't have what it takes, you will always have somebody next to you to tell you to keep going. And isn't it awesome that in every layer, in every company, if it was set up that you could walk through the system with someone else, how many people would stay on? If we could just develop teams and develop people that could reach back and help people up the hill versus watching them struggle because they're so... A fi uh, they're so uh, they fixed on being at the top. How much longer will we get these people on this side to become ambassadors? Because when you're on this side of the hills, when you know what, I've been around for 15 years, I've been around for 20 years, I've been doing this a long time, but it would be amazing if I could be an ambassador and go back to the start and start to help these people that are coming into business with all the information and all the wisdom that I have and pass that on. But most of the time, we get focused on this side, on the finish side. We finish. All right, I'm finished. I'm done. I'll never want to talk about that company again. But what if I can just go back and we can keep the cycle going? All the knowledge, all the wisdom, all my experience. I'm an ambassador for the company now. I'm an ambassador for the organization. I'm an ambassador for the ministry. What if I could go back and these young people coming in, these millennials, so to speak, these people coming in that don't have good work ethic, uh, allegedly, these people that don't know what they're doing, they, they want to do things differently. They want to wear T-shirts and jeans and they want to do all these things differently. What if you could just go back? and give them the information that they need to be successful? And what if they gave you the energy that they had for you to stay around a little bit longer so that we can continue to grow, continue to develop, and our culture can stay the way that it's supposed to as a positive culture because of all of your experience. The cycle just continues. But the majority of people are right here. And you have to locate yourself on this chart. You have to figure out where am I? Because if you're at the top and you're trying to grow your business and change your culture, 
all these people on the side of the hill, we have to develop. If you go to a leadership conference, they should be with you. They should be with you. If you listen to a podcast, so should everyone else that you work with. If you saw an inspirational video on Facebook or YouTube, you should send it to your entire team. Anything that you acquire from a knowledge base that's helping you to develop who you are within, you should be passing on to your team. People like marketing budgets. People will spend money on advertisement, but we will not spend money on developing the people within our business that's going to allow our business to grow. We don't want to walk as a duo. We'd rather do it on our own because if I get all the information, I can just go tell them about it. No, it's not the same because if I started a message here, you know the old school telephone game. By the time it gets to the back, it's going to be different and watered down, diluted, and we don't even know what happened. The experience of doing things together. Greatness demands a duo. So the question is, how do you accomplish this? You have to adapt and, and embrace this concept of we over me and everything that you do. Everything that you do. I read an excerpt from Antonio Smith's book. That's not my book. That's his book. It's our book because it's a Driven Foundation published book, but it's his book. But the concept is we over me, so it does not matter if he has success or if I have success. We have success together. My job is to raise him. He raises me. We work together. We walk in unison. We have people with us that help us make a difference. Greatness demands to do. I came in today. Um, our development and special events coordinator, Chelsea, in the back, she set up the table. She came in early. I didn't have to be here at 7 o'clock like she did, but she came in early. Greatness demands a duo. We over me. She made a sacrifice so that I could come up here and do this and not have to worry about it. Greatness demands a duo. We cannot overlook the people that do the little things, that respond to the emails that you didn't feel like responding to, the people that sent out the letter and, and, and the packages that you didn't feel like doing. You couldn't make it to the UPS. We over me and everything that we do. There's no such thing as me. It's we over me, and then transparency is key. Just be open, especially with small businesses and developing business. Be open. Be transparent about ex expectations. Be transparent about where you want to go. Be transparent sometimes even with finances, with the vision, with the mission. Just be completely open. Transparency is key. Be able to communicate. That's the main ingredient to integrity. You have to be able to be transparent. I'm going to share whatever I need to share with you to get you the information that you need to be successful, one way or another. And then last but not least, you have to build people. You have to build people. That's your focus. Hand out, pulling up. That is your focus. You build the people, the people will take care of the business. But we have to build the people that are working with us. And if it's just you right now, you have to start looking and taking an inventory of the people around you that you're like, man, this person could help me with my vision, but when you come together, it's not going to be about your vision. Now it's a we vision. It's how it works. Everybody has a job to play, but everybody's job is important. Here's another football reference. I'm sorry. I need an offensive line. There are the big guys in front. They block for the quarterback. The quarterback hands the ball off to the running back, but if he doesn't want to, he has to throw it to a wide receiver. I got four or five different people on the field at once, if one of those people don't do their job, you guys are going to be angry. You guys are going to be upset. Just one person make a mistake. If the coach calls the wrong play, it's a problem. Everybody has a job to play, right? We over me. You have to build people. Now, everything that we do with the Driven Foundation is about we. Everything that we do is about lifting each other up leveraging our respective platforms to make a difference. Your purpose in this world is the responsibility of using your platform to make a difference. That's why you're here on this earth. It does not matter what you do for a living. Like, that is not your purpose. That is your platform. Even if you're gifted in a certain area, it's just your platform. You can be a doctor, an attorney, a lawyer, a real estate agent, but what happens when you're 80 and you're still here and you can't do what you've been doing for the last 60 years? Does that mean you no longer have purpose? No, it just means that your platform has shifted. But if you understand that your purpose is to use your platform, whatever it is, to make a difference long term, that responsibility gives you the ability to leave your mark and to make a difference forever. So what you say, what you do, your attitude, your body language, everything about you is communicating a message. The message has to be we over me. I'm not going to be the person in that first hill where on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I give maximum effort, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I'm chilling. 
I'm relaxing. It's down here. I'm coasting. It's hump day. Let me just get over Wednesday and, the, and then I'm good. It's not enough just to want to build revenue or to build a company or have growth or have good culture. It's about developing people. What makes them tick? What drives them? You're having a bad day at work. Let's come into my office. Let's talk about what's going on with your son or with your daughter. Let's talk about what's going on in your family. Let's have those transparent conversations because lives are depending on us being we over me. I need you at your, when I needed you the most, were you at your best? Developing people. When I needed you the most, were you at your best or were you tired? Were you tired? Were you too tired to have that side conversation? Were you too, just, you know, I was too fatigued. I just had a long day. You're struggling at home, so you came and brought that into work, and now all of a sudden it's dribbling down to all the people on the hill. Your energy as the leader. I love purpose. You get to wake up every single day. Two people die every second on this earth, two people every second, 155,000 plus every day, 55.7 million people annually, and the number just continues to increase. And you got blessed to be here today. You, two every second. Raise your hand if you ever lost someone, passed away. Uh-huh. And you still here. You was texting and driving yesterday, but you made it. Teenagers, every 14 to 24, texting and driving. One of the biggest killers of young people. But you got the text and drive yesterday, the day before, the day before, the day before that. You had a DUI 10 years ago, could have killed everybody on the road, but you're still here. And we waking up tired. We don't want to develop people. We don't want to spend time with people, even though people have spent time with us. We know the stats. We know the statistics. Two people every second. Every day is a gift and you're here. You can't give your all today. We over me. You can't get you can't max out today. You can't give your all today. One of the strongest men that I've ever known in my life, his name is Mike Cooler, one of my former teammates, 6'4", 270 pounds, 600 pound bench press, 225 bench press, 49 times at the NFL Combine to set the NFL record, 4'6", 40, Pittsburgh Steeler, All-American, All-Big Ten, three sacks against Notre Dame in the 2005 Fiesta Bowl, did amazing things, was the COO of a billion dollar company that built medical facilities all around the country, committed suicide last June. 34 years old. You got to be thankful. You got to be thankful that you're here today, that you don't have the weight of the world on your shoulders, that you're not so stressed, that you want to, even if you had the thought, like, what would life be like without me? But you're still here. So you kept going. You kept persevering. Somebody built you up to endure whatever it was that had you thinking those negative thoughts. And that's how we got to build up the people on our team and the people that are working with us. That's what we're here for. That's how we leave our mark. That's how we make a difference. Got to be thankful. You got to max out today. You don't get a 600 pound bench press without maxing out occasionally to see how far you can go to strain just a little bit more. Straining for success for other people, not for yourself. Coach Urban Meyer was making $8 million a year, but he was making $8 million a year, not so that he could coach Ohio State football, but so he could build and develop those men underneath him. Because just his first round draft picks that he's produced from Florida and Ohio State, it's over $150 million. He makes eight a year, but the players that have come underneath him, just the first round picks, $150 million. He's building people. He's making dreams come true. He doesn't get paid to coach. He gets paid to develop. So you'll get taken care of for developing people. i got two minutes left, by the way. That's what it's about. Be thankful, max out. I learned that from Mike Cooler, the strongest man I've ever known. 600 pound bench press. But the strongest man I've ever known wasn't strong enough to endure the weight of the world. And neither are you. Neither are you. Make a difference. Use your platform to help people. That's, that's it, that's the goal. Forget the money. Forget how you feel. Take the emotions out of it. Because if tomorrow never came, you, I would do everything I possibly could today. I need to call some people. I need to text some people. If, what's the value of today if tomorrow never comes? It's priceless. It's everything. If you knew that tomorrow wouldn't happen for you, you would max out today. Everything. You would call everybody. You would text everybody. You would laugh at all my jokes that aren't funny. You would take notes. You would do everything you could. Because you're like, I don't get a chance to do this again. And you may not. Watch this, or the person that you're supposed to be developing may not. 
Because that one time that you didn't have time, that one time that you weren't focused, that one time that it was just too much, that one time, uh, another meeting, that one time, another morning breakfast, that one time, all oh, the tears of the chamber again, oh my gosh, here they go, another speaker, another three-point C's to success, another, oh, another, 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 another. Until you wake up and you're like, man, I wish I could do that again. I mean, I wish I could text Mike Kula. I mean, I talked to him a month before he passed. I, I mean, I, hey, man, maybe did I miss something? Probably. Instead of me talking about the spring game or the Buckeyes, I probably should, hey, man, how are you doing? What's really going on? Talk to me. But I didn't. I was probably focused on building what I want to build and doing what I want to do. And I don't blame myself. It just means that I could have took another step. I could have had a two, like 30 more seconds. What if I had to ask that tough question and been transparent? 30 more seconds, maybe he might be here. Maybe not, I don't know. I just don't want you to be in that situation. Again, if you have already. So no matter what you're dealing with personally, obviously keep believing in yourself, keep developing, keep doing what you're supposed to do. Take care of your health, whatever it is that you've been putting off and procrastinating and hesitating on, it's hurting your business and it's hurting you and it's hurting your family. The more you drag your feet, the more people get drugged through the mud. Stop hesitating, stop procrastinating. Fix the problem that needs to be fixed. Build you and then start to build your business back to what it's supposed to be or build it up to what the maximum potential is when you can start walking in duos. Antonio Smith is my right-hand man, period. That's my guy. His story is the same as mine. I didn't have time to get into my story. Raised in the inner city of Cleveland, Ohio. Single mom. Dad was a heroin addict. Used to beat on me. Used to beat on my mom. Went to prison multiple times. We didn't have anything. Almost homeless all the time. Mom didn't even have a car until I was in the eighth grade. Wait, we didn't have anything. I came from absolutely nothing. There's 7.4 billion people in the world. It's only 160 NFL wide receivers that are in the NFL at one given moment. I was one of those 160 for four straight years. So one out of 160 out of 7.4 billion is .00000216. That's the chances of me actually making it and making my dreams come true, but I couldn't do it by myself. I needed a duo. My early duo was my mom. She's still my duo, right? But I couldn't get there without her and the, the coaches that come along. Power of we over me. It's very, 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 very valuable. That's how you build people. That's how you develop leaders from within. Our culture is we. And if you don't align with that on your thoughts, on your feelings, on your emotions, on your work ethic, then you're not somebody that needs to be affiliated with our team. There may be a place for you, just not with us. So um, I slow walk you through it. I gave you an opportunity to get some, I don't know, bullet points or whatever you call those things. All right. Now it's time to apply it. You've got to have a certain mindset. We over me. Get your passion back. Get your enthusiasm back. Get your energy back. Don't let the time of the day dictate how much energy you have in this room. Do what you have to do. All right. I knew I was able to go over a little bit because it's a 15 minute break. You just got here. You need a 15 minute break? You need a break. Just got here. <laughs> anyway, Mr. Teresa, thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. Thank you.